Today on the Anxiety at Work podcast, we are tuning into silence and how unplugging can help build resilience and wellness. I'm Chester Ellen. And I'm Adrian Gostick. You know, in this episode, we've invited two amazing guests to help us explore our modern obsession with the pursuit of dopamine and our addiction to noise and stimulus. And we're really looking forward to this discussion. So we're going to compare all that with patience and compassion. (laughs) That's right. And on the show, we'll introduce you to our new friends, Justin Talbert Zorn. He has served as both a policymaker and a meditation teacher in the U.S. Congress, a Harvard and Oxford trained specialist in economics and in psychology and the psychology of well-being. He is the co-founder of Astria Strategies, a consultancy that helps leaders and teams envision and communicate solutions to complex challenges. Lee Mars is a collaboration consultant and leadership coach for major universities, corporations, and federal agencies. She has led diverse initiatives, including a training program to promote an experimental mindset among teams at NASA and a decade-long collaboration to reduce toxic chemicals in products. She is the co-founder as well of Astria Strategies. Together, they are the authors of the new book, Golden, from HarperCollins Publisher. Welcome to the show, Lee and Justin. We are delighted to have you on our podcast. Uh, Thanks for having us. So glad to be here. Thank you. Well, I'm going to start with you, Justin. I want you to get us into this idea of golden um, and why we should care about the power of silence in this world full of noise. So tell us how you came to this topic and, and why we should all care. Mm, thank you for the question, Irene. You know, for us, it really grew out of a question that's probably familiar to a lot of your listeners, which is just, what are we going to do about this crazy world? What are we going to do about the state of things? How can we possibly bring more sanity? Lee and I both felt an intuition that the prerequisite to doing anything positive in our own personal lives, in our workplaces, our communities, broader world, a prerequisite is to get beyond the noise. We felt this intuition that the answers might not always be in more thinking or talking. The answers might sometimes be in the silence. So we wrote an article about this intuition for Harvard Business Review. The article did well, really resonated with people, really resonated with this deep need that folks are feeling for silence right now. So we just continued following the cookie crumbs from there and interviewing all sorts of people about the meaning of silence, the power of silence, neuroscientists, poets, politicians, business people, activists. And what we found really surprised us. You know, it's it's so interesting that you you say one of the solutions is we don't need more talking. (laughs) I I just love Mm -hmm. that insight because somehow, you know, we get in that, we call it the advice monster, where we just think if we keep talking, if we keep talking, We'll come to some kind of resolution, which brings me to to you, Lee. You've got a chapter in the book on why silence is scary, why people are afraid to be quiet and unplugged nowadays. And and I want to share a quick antidote. Um, You know, I've got this young guy that's a friend of mine. And I said, hey, by the way, do you ever turn off your phone? And he said, no. I said, but at night you put it on like airplane. He goes, no. And I said, well, why would you never turn off your phone? He said, because I'm afraid I'll miss something. And I thought, mm. for him, silence is scary, isn't it? So expound on that a little bit, because I love, I love that take that for some people, silence is upsetting. Absolutely. And actually, I want to link that to the types of noise we're looking at. It's not just auditory noise, the, you know, the decibels measured in decibels, but informational noise. And I think some of what you're pointing to is that we have a mass proliferation of information available to us more than any time in history we know, but also um, it's been estimated that since the dawn of civilization, 2003, we are still, we're creating that, as much information as in that entire chunk of time, every day as in that entire chunk of time. So this is a mass amount of information coming our way. And we um, can get caught into thinking all that information is necessary. We could be missing something very important. And it's extremely exhausting to us. In fact, another study found that millennials also, like your friend, experience great anxiety being away from their phone, even very briefly. 
So what is going on there? We're wondering as well. And we also look at in internal noise. I just want to break those things out. So auditory noise, informational noise, that is unwanted distraction through sound, through information, and then internal noise, that which is happening inside us. I bring that up, especially for this podcast, as we're looking at anxiety, because anxiety is one of those very loud things that can happen to us internally. So, but turning to why silence is scary, um, there are a million reasons why silence is scary, but I think one of it is it's even scarier than ever because of the amount of noise and information that's out there. But we turn to great thinkers like Roshi Joan Halifax, a Zen priest and expert at end of life, and she says that when we stop our habitual mental and physical activity to sit quietly, difficulties often become more visible. We can become even more sensitive to the suffering and feel at risk for breakdown. So that is legitimately scary. So we, we meet in this, in this uh, chapter, we meet the reader where they are, where we are sometimes too, mind you, to normalize that that's an, a frequent response. It's a common response. It's an understandable response in this world of a lot of noise, a lot of covering up, a lot of distraction, that when we do stop and sit with ourselves quietly, um, that sometimes that, those difficulties arise to the surface and that can be hard. That can be scary. Just, just a link is uh, too that any of the, as Lee's talking about that link between anxiety and and noise or silence. Help us understand that maybe a little bit more. Hmm. We spoke with Judson Brewer, who's one of the world's leading neuroscientists, who's really specialized in fMRI studies of meditators and various brain scans of meditators. And one thing that Judson does, he's based at Brown University. One thing that he does that's really unique and powerful is rather than just studying the human brain in meditation as though it's some kind of external phenomenon that can be understood completely separate from the, the uh, meditator's experience, rather than just, say, studying a meditator for a full hour and what's going on in their brain, he has meditators do a short run of practice while they're in the fMRI machine. And then he asks them to narrate what was actually going on in your experience, so he can really get a sense of how the individual's personal felt subjective experience lines up with what he's seeing in the brain scans. And through this really uh, unique approach, he told us that he has uncovered a sense of what it looks like for a person to experience noise in the consciousness, which is a state he sees as akin to anxiety. And he describes that as a state of contraction. And when we ask him more about contraction, he says it's, it's what you feel for yourself in a subjective way. When the body feels contracted, when the mind feels contracted, when your thoughts feel contracted and limited. And then he says there's an experience, there's something, there's a kind of felt experience and something that he could notice through this, these brain scans that's a kind of common denominator to what people experience in states of silence in the mind in states beyond the anxiety in the mind. And he calls it an experience of expansion. And I think we all know what this contracted state feels like versus this expanded state. And one thing we love about this approach for thinking about anxiety, for thinking about the link between noise in the mind, that kind of noise as Lee was describing it, of all this unwanted interference, how that relates to anxiety. And then this feeling of silence not in the sense of silence that we can't speak or a silence of censorship, but this silence of being in a place where no one is making claims on the consciousness, where there's nothing interfering with our perception and our intention. That to us is the antithesis of anxiety. And it's this, it's this feeling of expansion in the body and the mind. I love that idea, Justin, you know, expansion versus contraction. So in your book, you have a field guide and you help people start getting ready and preparing to be in, more, in a more contemplative place. So walk us through a few of the best practices that you've found. Mm -hmm. Well, first, we turn to an expert in biobehavioral health and medicine, Joshua Smythe, who um, tuned us into the fact that quiet is what we think and experience quiet to be. So the first thing to tune into is really your own experience about quiet. When do you notice, to use Justin's you know, 
point about expansion. When do you feel expansive? Perhaps softened in the bodies, relaxed. Uh, your mind feels clear. You're not ruminating about things versus when do you feel contracted just the opposite so tuning into what truly brings you quiet so we'll say for example that meditation may not be that thing that brings you quiet it may not be that thing even after years and years of practice it could be something else it could be more like flow states that brings you a quietening in your mind to to where you can enjoy that experience it could be other things where you just take in a moment of awe and really learn to cultivate and, uh, and that gratitude for those moments of awe and that that is quietening to yourself, a, a self-transcendent experience like that. Or we can just appreciate other little small moments, little pockets of silence throughout the day where we might step out into the sun and feel the rays of the sun on our skin, listen to the wind in the trees, to the bird song, things like this. So it could be involved, it could be nature, it could be you know, time with others. The other thing we like to emphasize in this book that is, is that silence doesn't need to only be found alone. It can be found with coworkers. It can be found with family members, friends, and community. And that a shared silence can be compounded, magnified. Yeah. So there's so many. Really, it's about getting attuned to what is truly quietening for you, and what really brings in the noise, and getting really interested in that difference, finding your own way. Yeah. Well, first and foremost, I want to say, uh, Lee, both you and Justin have very calming voices. I mean, oh, I'm, fi- I'm finding <laughs> peace and, 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 and quiet just uh, listening to you so you truly live your brand. Uh, you mentioned something, Lee, that's kind of interesting. You, you talk about the difference between uh, working quiet and living quiet. And I think a lot of us would feel like we can maybe find a little more quiet in our personal lives as opposed to at work. And yet you mentioned you can find quiet with your coworkers. You want to expand on that just a little bit? Yeah, I mean, and, and some people really do find it a little easier with their coworkers, especially if everyone's on the same page. Like, for example, when I work with scientists and engineers who are wanting to work on the, the problem of, of uh, pollutants in our products, they're really invested in this and they're wanting to do something different. The same old, same old way of drowning one another in data in really bad news data right. is not creating quiet and it's not creating novel thinking and it's not creating the solutions they need. So I can actually coax them to get out into the redwoods and share some time together in a different way, which combines focused work and time in nature and even some fun and delicious meals and really connecting to the redwoods, you know, who really are these beautiful guardians of silence. And that creates a different, a unique experience. But really, your coworkers, you and your coworkers are probably pretty aware of how distracted the work environment and the inability to do deep work is. So we can get on the same page and make some great agreements as coworkers, just like we can do that at home. And some of us may have more ability to find those um, partnerships at work and sometimes maybe at home and sometimes our two-year-olds are not as agreeable right to the quiet on the home front you know just as a random example yeah it's actually a lot easier to be quiet yeah when you have when you're old like Chester versus you have two-year-olds around yeah yeah of course Chester actually does have some two-year-olds around grandkids oh I do too I have um I have two-year-old twins, oh my actually, gosh. you know, five-year-old at the moment. So it's, you know, so what Lee mentioned, you know, sometimes it's easier to find the quiet at work than home. That resonates. I mean, it's a joyful sound and stimulus in my home for sure. I mean, sometimes when there's a lot of crying, it can be intense. <laughs> but, but we find that, you know, the common denominator to finding silence in groups, whether that's in the workplace or at home, the common denominator is something that's really quite surprising, which is that we often have to have a conversation about noise. It often requires more conversation to find silence as a group. And the conversation is about the quiet that we seek, the quiet that we need to work or to regenerate our energy. It's about the way that we can build appreciation for quiet in a group, in a family, among friends, Say you're on vacation or doing something with a group of friends. How do, you, how do you shift the norms so there's appreciation of quiet? And of course, this comes up most in workplaces. How do we shift the norms so there's appreciation of quiet? 
We just wrote a new piece in Harvard Business Review about this, how to build a culture that honors quiet time based on what's in the book. And we look at the story of the, the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia, 1787, and how at that time, the delegates to the Constitution had, to the Constitutional Convention, had a giant mound of dirt built outside Constitution Hall. And they did that because they had a shared cultural norm that they believed it was important that they'd be able to cultivate pristine human attention to do this very difficult job of writing the Constitution. You know, we fast forward 200 some years to what it's like for lawmakers in the U.S. now. As you mentioned, I worked in the in the U.S. Congress for many years, both as a legislative director for some members of Congress on working on policy and also as a meditation teacher. And the sonic environment was the polar opposite of that. Because, you know, and it's not just, you know, we could say all the all we could say about dysfunction in Congress, but it's something that actually applies to many of our workplaces right now. There's not much appreciation of pristine human attention. There's not much of appreciation of what Lee mentioned before, that this power of silence can be magnified when it's shared. So we look in the book of what it means to have these conversations so that we can come together and express what we need in terms of noise, in terms of silence, and in terms of how to create these spaces for doing work with pristine attention, having time for reflection in pristine attention. And so we could get beyond those kinds of flawed cultures and norms and workplaces and other environments that so often mistake stress for aliveness. Yeah, mm-hmm. we, we've found in our work too that, yeah, the human brain needs not only time when it's not working, but when it's not thinking about work. And so what do we yeah. do? We, as bosses, we send out these emails on Saturday afternoon and we go, ah, oh, my people know that's just how I work. They don't have to respond, but that's right. noise. And all they think of, people are thinking about that weekend is, is the noise that's out there and the worry and the, and we have to allow silence. Yeah. yeah. We, and so uh, tell us a little bit about how people can learn more about your important work, Lee and Justin. Sure. Well, you can go to astreastrategies.com. Uh, that's A-S-T-R-E-A strategies.com to learn about our work in the world. And our work in the world right now is this book. So we'd love for you to get your hands on Golden, The Power of Silence in a World of Noise in any of those places that you find and buy books. Um, yeah, and I just want to say you did ask about practices, and we do name a lot of very specific practices to spark ideas in the reader to see, you know, again, once you know, once you're kind of tuning into what your quiet is, there are ideas for individuals, just little to find those little moments of silence. And for us to also seek out more rapturous, more, you know, bigger chunks and times and deeper time in silence to really plan for that, including DIY retreats and things like that, sabbaticals, stuff like that. And then also how to take that to your family and friends with concrete ideas on how to do, you know, to broach those sometimes awkward conversations about having more silence in your relationship and sharing more silence. And then we open up to policy and regulators and culture and how we could do this, embrace this as a society more to make more space for silence for all. Yeah, it's really beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. You know, uh, we are big proponents of gratitude and the power of gratitude. Is there a link between gratitude and silence in your practice? Did you find any research to to back that up? I'll go to you first, Justin. Sure, it's such a beautiful question, Chester. I mean, we find that appreciation, noticing, is a doorway to gratitude. It's a prerequisite to being able to feel gratitude. And this book is fundamentally about appreciation. This book is about how to get beyond that which is interfering with our ability to appreciate what's in front of us. You know, when we're caught up in having to think of what to say, when we're caught up in what to put on Instagram, what to post on Twitter, we find ourselves in a situation where it's difficult to glimpse reality in a direct, unmediated way. And that's the essence of gratitude, being able to be present with what's beautiful in our lives, be present with what's gracious in our lives. And this is the essence of how we describe silence. Again, not as the silence of you know, complacency or not as the silence of apathy or censorship, but a different level of silence 
where we're able to directly perceive what's in front of us with nothing making these claims on our consciousness. And we do have one little practice in there, little gifts of silence. When, when we do find our plans in a day have been way late or we're in a long line or in traffic or, you know, just something has surprised us and or, you know, our phone's broken or whatever, rather than get distressed and caught up in that, to take that moment, to be grateful for that moment where you can invite silence in and just be, just be in that moment instead of being, you know, in the hustle of it all. So it's a little gratitude practice. I love that idea, yeah. And that yeah. really... Oh, sorry, go ahead, Justin. That really connects to the essence of the book, too. Just uh, sorry to interrupt, just a moment. Just that really, what Lee just said, connects to the essence of why we wrote this book is to appreciate silence, to have gratitude for the silence that exists in our lives. Because in this space, we can find a surprising abundance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Last night I was going, my phone's running out of battery. It's like, <laughs> I put it down. I went, good. Ah, <laughs> uh, see, exactly. you're already doing it. Yeah, so. <laughs> exactly. That's what Lee means by that. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, okay t- walk us through it. I'm really curious here. We, we usually ask people, okay, tell us about your daily practices to, to keep up your emotional fitness. So with all that you've learned about silence, how do you practice this each day? Lee, uh, kick us off. Well, I'm a dancer, a dance teacher, choreographer, um, as well as all the other things in my life, but that is my daily way to find silence. So flow states is very accessible, even universal. The research Chicksetme High found is that this was a really universal concept, so not just a sort of industrial elites or anything like that. So finding your way to flow. So for me being in movement, having loud music, right, ironically, but a quiet interiority, Uh, and focusing on transmitting dance to a bunch of students in the present moment. Like there's just, we're doing it right then and there. They're reflecting it back. Could you teach Chester, do you think? think (laughs) I I can teach anybody and it would be a joy to do so. Chester, we'll find our time for sure. But that moment, it's really beautiful. (laughs) And and you can really, when you do get something like a a flow state in your regular uh, day, you can really tune into like, oh, if I notice a thought, gallops into my mind everything gets messed up right i mess up the steps i'm not trans i'm not connected with the group as much so there's a that's a great place of study for internal noise and internal quiet that i just want to put a shout out for that but also just little moments i go out into the garden and putter and weed and uh you know just take in the flowers and i really love watching bees and that is one of my ways to quiet as well in the day to day what about you justin you know, I would think about it in terms of in terms of meditation, how we're often trained to meditate, you know, do it in the morning, do it in the evening, have your practice, have your ritual, have your way of meditating. You know, and one thing we've noticed, and this is certainly something I've noticed, is that a lot of people these days are beating themselves up for not meditating enough. Oh my God, why aren't I maintaining my practice? You know, why can't I just do this practice? We know so many people, and you know, as Lee mentioned, you know, we've been... And as you mentioned in your intro, we've, we both have a good amount of experience, both as practitioners and, and teachers of meditation, but there have been certainly times when we felt that, uh, this as well. So we think of this book as a kind of non-meditator's guide to getting beyond the noise. And for me, in terms of my daily practice, I've been moving away from necessarily needing to do a practice in the morning and evening. When I can, when I do, that's wonderful. What I've been working to do is turn toward a practice of simply appreciating the silence, like we were talking about before. If I have a couple minutes in between meetings or in between when the kids are occupied doing their thing, and I can step outside and, as Lee mentioned, feel the rays of the sun, just simply listen to the sound of the breeze and the branches, to nothing in particular, just tune in and listen to the simple essence of what is, There's no need for a fancy practice, no need to buy a fancy cushion or bell or anything like that. Just listen. And this really gets to why we wrote this book, you know, wanting to give people license to not need to have a fancy meditation practice or ask themselves questions like, am I doing it right? But to simply tune into the silence that even if you live in a loud urban soundscape, the silence is still present. Mm -hmm. You can find it. You just got to look sometimes. You just got to listen. 
It's so interesting that you bring this up. You know, Adrian and I have a dear friend, Aisha Bursell, and she's a designer. And I'll never forget, my wife and I, we live in Jersey. She lives in, in Manhattan. We went and just have coffee and, and, and talk. And as we're walking down the street in this just ridiculously, like you say, the soundscape of New York, you know, she said, it was a beautiful sunny day. She said, let's just stop and enjoy this moment of mm. friendship, of sunshine. And Lee, when you said, you know, I love watching the bees, it's one of my favorite things to do. You know, we have gardens and you see the bees in their industry. We've got a, a place in upstate New York and I love watching the spiders on the dock and just in, enjoying the, the those those simple moments that, as you say, Justin, are everywhere. If we'll just take a moment to stop and say, let's enjoy this moment, right? On a nice cushion with a cool bell next to us, which I think would really <laughs> put the cherry on top. I don't think you got it at all, Justin. Yeah. <laughs> Just don't let that get in the way. Yeah, you know, exactly. if you've already got your cushion yeah. and bell, go for exactly. it. Hey, um, this has been such a great discussion. Um, what are the one or two things that you want people to take away from this conversation? I'll start with you first, Justin. But if there were one or two things from the whole conversation that you said, hey, if you didn't remember anything, please remember this, what would they be? We say in the book, you know, rather than having all these fancy strategies and meditation and the cushions and bells, <laughs> fine if you got them, um, but rather than needing all of that, notice noise, tune into silence. Notice the noise that's present in your day. Notice the forms of interference with your perception and attention and just notice it. Study how to navigate it. Then find these pockets of silence, even if they're only available like that moment sitting with your friend in the sunshine in Manhattan, even if that moment is only two seconds, even if it's only the gap between the words spoken in conversation, see how deeply you can enter the silence. Mm -hmm. And then from time to time, seek moments of rapturous silence, deep silence, thundering silence in your life that can change you, that can bring transformation. Oh, that's fabulous. Mm -hmm. Lee, yeah. what yeah, would you add? Yeah. yeah. I would add, I want to invite in that, that piece that we said about quiet is what people think quiet is. So, so to the listeners, quiet is what you experience as quiet. And that can be a strange thing, like the person in the study that Joshua Smythe told us about, who is a chainsaw carver. He carves large chunks of wood. That's his flow state. That's his quiet. That's his way. And so to not get too caught up in other people's ways, to really, truly find your way. If it's doing a puzzle, if it's, you know, watching bees, if it's scratching your dog, you know, it's, it's, it's like whatever that is. I, one person said it was their deepest quiet was scratching their dog's ear. Great. You know, whatever that is, find it, seek it out, preserve it you know, do that. And the other thing is just a reminder that we know how to do this as humans. You know silence. Innately, we know how to find our way there and how important it is. We just need to stop a little bit more than we are right now. The world is louder than it's ever been. So I want to validate that and make time for silence. And you know how to do it. You'll find your way. That is a perfect way to end this uh, end this this podcast. Thank you so much for your time, and your work, and the peace that you're bringing to people, and that embracing of quiet. Uh, Adrian, uh, I'm less anxious now than I've probably been Yay. in a month. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. No, this has been so good. It's been so introspective. In 30 minutes, you've you've changed my perspective. And so we encourage everybody to pick up the book, Golden. And thank you, Justin. Thank you, Lee, for your time today. Thank you both so much. This was great. Great way to start the it's day. It's a joy to be with you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Well, Chess, just really interesting. I, you know, just noticing our energy levels sort of <laughs> calmed as Justin and Lee started talking, and so that was that was terrific themselves. They they really do practice what they preach. Yeah, those 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 calming voices. You know, it was really interesting. I, I the power of silence. You know, uh, we do live in such a chatterbox culture. You know, it's just incessant. I loved when uh, Lee was talking about how silence is scary. Silence yeah. is scary for people because they're, they're used to filling all the gaps. And 
you know, I, I remember being like that. Like, I'd get in the car, I'd turn on the radio for sports radio, I'd have a podcast going, go for these morning walks. I always felt like I had to have something in my ears. And yet, every now and again, you just say, you know what? Mm-hmm. I'm just going to go for a walk. Yeah. I'm just going to let it be quiet for a minute. And, and how powerful that is. What I, what I really love about their work is there's a discipline behind it. Like anything you do, if you want to get good at it, you know, you have to practice. That discipline of finding what I really found refreshing is just a couple of seconds, you know, just a, a second here, a second there. Be attuned to those moments of silence. What, what were some of your takeaways? Yeah, and he says, you know, go deep as you can. How deep can you enter that moment of silence? So, so I thought this was important is that uh, when we are in the noise, we're in a strait of contraction. I see this yeah. is we get in these doom spirals. And I see it, especially with younger people nowadays. They're so worried about climate change, so worried about the the fall of democracy in America. They are so worried. And I'm not saying any of those things are not important, but they put you in a state of contraction. And that's all you begin to worry about. And expansion comes in the silence. And so are we taking the times each day to, and and, and both of them made the point, it's not to, to meditate. It's not to, to dance. It's to find the thing that gives you that flow and that time away, whether it's, you know, working with a chainsaw or, or rubbing your dog's ears or, or sniffing your dog's ears, as somebody <laughs> once told me, which, by the way, is not pleasant. I wouldn't do that. Yeah. Um, I, I, I was really appreciating their connection to, to nature. I and mean, we've seen this a lot in people ma- managing their anxieties, going for walks, doing some gardening watching the bees. Uh, she said something that uh, the Redwoods, the guardians of silence, what a, what a great, you know, metaphor mm-hmm. to use for these magnificent Redwoods. And if you've ever been in those forests, it really is, it, you see these incredible trees and it does, it does make you just quiet down and go, wow. As a Jersey guy, did you say, these are huge. These trees are huge. <laughs> <laughs> Who's growing that tree? Oh, man, you could make a whole house out of that tree. Yeah, um, that awe. You know, they did talk about silence and, and awe. And thank you for making fun of my home state. Uh, I, I pre- appreciate that very much. <laughs> you know, I, I'm really interested in your take in filing, finding silence at work. Uh, yeah. You know, I, we, we love Marcus Aurelius, right? The Roman emperor yeah. who, who every day would find time to, to contemplate in his business work schedule. How do you do that? I mean, they talked a little bit about it. What were your takeaways? It was really interesting. You know, it, the workplace thing kind of rang true to me when he started to talk about the Constitution. Here they were under all this pressure and so on, and yet they took time to cultivate, you know, this big pile of dirt. Um, take time to, to sit back and listen to your co-workers. I'll never forget one of the best advice I ever got. Um, Donnie Williams was my manager in New York, and he said, hey, Chess, I want you to go into your office don't answer the phones. Don't do anything. I want you to just sit down and think about the business. Just sit and think about the business. That, that was great advice. I think often in work, we just go from Zoom to Zoom to Zoom or meeting to meeting to meeting. And we don't take that break to step back and say, what, what did we talk about? What, you know, that, that reflection. He said, you know, that, that silence leads to reflection. And I found that really, really helpful. You know, you and I have talked a lot that We shouldn't have 60-minute meetings. They should be 45 minutes. They should be 50 minutes. Give yourself that gap to just think. That was my takeaway. It was great. And and my last one was just to be appreciative, you know, linking this to gratitude, to be appreciative of those times where we are, in a way, forced to be quiet. Like my, you know, my phone dying. It's like, (laughs) terrific. And how often do we do that? You know, you know, you, you know, what do you mean? I have to be stuck on the tarmac for another 15 minutes before my plane takes off? You know, we get all worked up. Um, are there ways that we can appreciate the quiet that comes in our lives? That's tough, it is. but it's it's an important one. Yeah. It is, you know, to appreciate a traffic jam. You know, that was one of your stuck yeah. in there. Appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, just taking that deep breath. Well, I I, I I can't tell you how much I enjoyed, you know, this podcast and the, the idea, the, the book Golden, highly recommend it. You know, buy one for you and buy one for a friend who uh, who needs it as well. This idea of let's just take a step back. Take a couple of seconds. Take a couple of moments. And the, the other thing that I loved is when they tied it to gratitude at the end. That appreciate the silence. And appreciation is the gateway to gratitude. 
I made sure to write that down. I, I love that concept. Well, as we wrap up, uh, anything anything I missed or anything we missed? Well, uh, well, we are appreciative to our producer, Brent Klein, to Christy Lawrence, who helps us find amazing guests like Justin and Lee, and to all of you who have listened in, and, and especially if you download, that really helps us build our, our following. Um, you know, we encourage you to pick up our book, uh, Anxiety at Work, and to, uh, to give us a call if you'd like somebody to speak virtually or in person on the topics of wellness, resilience, or anxiety at work. Excellent. Yeah. Share the podcast with a friend and, and join our online community, The Culture Works. You know, it's a, a safe place. There's lots of great people in there helping each other out, you know, enjoying that meditative, that reflective place where you can lower your anxiety and find some allies at work. And as Adrian said, please pick up a copy of our book and, and, and invite us to speak at your organization. It really is interesting for us when we get together live or on or virtually and we talk about things that are really important over and above getting the work done. How do we take care of each other physically and mentally and, and tamping down that anxiety? Well, Adrian, you know, uh, we release a podcast every week. We sure appreciate everybody that tunes in. And we really do hope that you are creating a place at work where the anxiety levels are lower, where you can really feel good about going to work, the work that you do, and take that home and share it with your families. We love the ripple effect, don't we? We do. So have a great week, everybody. We wish you the best of mental health. Take care and be well. <laughs>